are so glad that you're here. My name is Leslie, and I am the children's director here. Hey, if you're new or just checking us out for the first time, we cannot wait until we can gather and be together with you in person. But until then, if you wouldn't mind going to our website at canyonsprings.org new and fill out a little uh, welcome card just to let, help us know who you are, um, we would love to send you a Starbucks card in the mail to just say hey and let you know that we're thinking about you. Hey, we have three ways to, to forgiving if you came prepared to give today. We have an online safe and secure method if you would like to do that way. We also have a text to give program and you can always drop it off at the Cove. Um, I have one more announcement for you, but I'll be right back. Hey guys, Foreman Leslie here on site at Concrete and Cranes. I know we are all bummed that the traditional BBS isn't gonna happen this year, but great news. We are taking our BBS outside into backyards all over our community. My foreman, Joby, is just across the way at the other construction site. She has some very important news to share with you guys today. Whoa, where did that come from? Hey guys, foreman Joby here, and we are so excited for this year's Backyard BBS. It's July 27th through the 31st. It's free, and we want you to sign up online. But you know what? It's so loud out here, I'm going to have to send you back to Miss Leslie. I'm here doing my part, getting everything set up for Backyard BBS. I need you guys to log on to SanDiegoBBS.com so you can secure your spot in someone's backyard. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have crafts and games and story time and singing. Uh, there's, there's a lot to do. to join us in our backyard VBS this year. One thing Joby and I keep learning this season is God keeps making a way. Just like he parted the seas when they thought there was no way, uh, God continues to make a way. So if you would join us in prayer as we do something new that we're unsure of, that's a little bit uh, unique, um, just that God would fill in all the gaps, that would be great. And if you would like to join and be a part of it, you can log on to SanDiegoVBS.com. All right, I'm going to pray for us and the band is going to kick us off. So God, we are so grateful for this morning and we are grateful for all of the ways that you continue to show up and fill in the gaps. And God, I just pray that you um, be with us throughout this morning. Uh, we give this time to you, Lord, and we commit it in your name. It's in Jesus Christ we pray, amen.
Darkness tries to roll over my bones And sorrow comes to steal the joy I own and Brokenness and pain is all I know oh, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide. 
Amen. You guys out there? It's dark. <laughs> oh, Lord, we are grateful that in you, Lord, we can stand fearless. With all that's going on, we can be tested. Lord, we might experience, we might experience fear, but in the midst of that fear, we will experience courage as we look to you. And we realize that the one who stands for us stands stronger than the one who stands against us. Lord, we pray for strength. We pray for, for, for boldness. We pray for courage during this time. We pray for wisdom as we need it. Lord, we ask even, even right now, we ask that as, as, as your word is brought forth, as you speak by your spirit to us, God, that you would grant us wisdom. That you would speak something to us that, that, that is a way to walk, a way to live, that just unpacks maybe that mystery that's been just lingering in our minds. That the, the how am I supposed to respond in this time, in this moment? Lord, we know that you can do that by your spirit. And it might be a different thing for different people listening. And so we pray, God, that we could hear your voice. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, good morning, Canyon Springs. I'm so happy to be joining you wherever you're at. Um, at home, at your relative's house, at a friend's house, wherever you find yourselves today, I'm glad that I get to be uh, speaking to you today. And today, I think Jesus has an invitation for you. And, and that invitation is an invitation to intimacy. Um, I'm happy to be here right now with some of my youth, some of my favorite students. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> And uh, as you guys know, if you've been following our Instagram, our new high school pastor, Luke, starts next week, July 1st, um, and he's really excited to meet you guys, and I believe you are going to connect with him a lot. He's a great guy, and you're going to love him and his family. So Luke, we are excited. Katie Springs is excited to welcome you next week. Um, so I want to start off kind of talking about COVID-19. We're, we're in the midst of this, and it just seems, I don't know if you feel it, but like a roller coaster ride of COVID-19. And so I have been, I've been kind of processing things. And I went down a rabbit trail the other night, and I do those a lot, often on YouTube. And I found a video on YouTube that kind of took you through the history of COVID-19. I think we're at about the 100-day mark uh, of quarantine as things are starting to reopen, and, and there's the, the world seems a little chaotic. And so I watched this video, and it's crazy how fast things progressed with COVID-19. It started off, and it was 14 days, stay at home. And then what started to happen in the beginning was there was like this hustle and bustle that started to happen at Trader Joe's, at Costco, and Trader Joe's sold out of food, and Costco sold out of toilet paper. And there was like this almost like implicit competitive nature that started to take place. And I remember uh, when the lines, you started, to have to, you started to have to wait in line at Trader Joe's. And I remember feeling like, uh, as the uh, husband of my household, my wife's like, you're going out. Like, I ain't going to the store. Like, you're going to be the one. Anybody else, that was you. Like, you were the one at home. You can raise your hand right now. Who's the sole proprietor of food at your house? Okay, guys, if that's you, I'm talking to you, all right? Girls, if that's you, I'm talking to you. When I became the sole proprietor of food, I almost felt like I was like this uh, like hunter-gatherer that took place. Like I was going to put on my mask, embrace the world of COVID-19, and I felt like, uh, like I was going out and I was like hunting. And I'd go home, I'd be like, babe, like I came home, like I got the provisions for my, for my family, like I am providing for you guys. And I honestly felt like this. Like, I got my dog, I got my gun, like, I'm going out there and I'm providing for my family. Uh, it felt like this, maybe, like, old, like, old school, like, shooting the bow and arrow, when in, in reality, the modern day dad is actually a little more like that. Just kind of standing in line, and that's actually not true of us being the hunter and gatherer. And so when things started to sell out and the lines started, you, I, I started to notice this uh, competitive nature that took place. Uh, one place that seemed to not really get on board with uh, lines or anything w was Old Vons. Okay, if you're not in Scripps Ranch, uh, we are known by two grocery stores. We got Old Vons and we got New Vons. Old Vons is the older Vons. And it, it's honestly, I don't know why we call it the Old Vons anymore. It's been there for uh, a while. But then the New Vons has already been there for 20 years. So it's not like it's even that new. I think we should call the Old Vons Ghetto Vons because... <laughs> 
The old Vons is like Knott's Berry Farm. New Vons is like Disneyland, okay? You go to old Vons in the beginning of COVID-19, and let me start with this. You go to new Vons during COVID-19 in the beginning, there's segmented lines. Everything's pristine and wiped down. I mean, it's like you're at Disneyland. People are polishing their hand sanitizing the cars. You go to old Vons beginning of COVID-19, and people are like, they don't care what you're doing. They're like, just go in. There's like half arrows on one aisle. There's like no arrows on the other aisle. Knott's Berry Farm is old Vons. Disneyland is new Vons. Let me try again. Old Vons is Popeyes. New Vons is Chick-fil-A. Can I get an amen? Let's go. <laughs> And so one rule I always broke during COVID-19, I seem to unintentionally and intentionally always break it, was the arrows. Anybody else, you just cannot get the arrows down. It was the hardest thing. I know there's arrows, but I would just like stumble over them. Old Vons had them on half the row. But there was like this hustle and bustle, right? With getting food, with getting toilet paper. And in the book of John, there is actually a story where you see this competitive nature in people, where you see this hustle and bustle. And it's within that story that you're going to find this invitation to intimacy. And it's John chapter 5, and here's what it says. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, was a pool, which in Aramaic, Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever diseases with which he was afflicted. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. So this guy's been there for a while. And Jesus comes up to him and he says this. He says, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, while I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, a, a day of rest. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, the leader, they came out and they said to him, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Notice that he says, the man who made me well. He doesn't know who that man was. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And then watch what Jesus does. He comes and he finds him, and he says this. He says, see, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. John 5, verses 1 to 15, that's out of the NIV. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever flown first class? Anybody here flown first class? Okay. I have, all right. I've flown first class. I've been there. I've done it. My aunt works for the airlines. I've done it once. My aunt does not hook it up a lot. Aunt Beth, if you're watching, you can hook it up a little more. But I've flown first class once. What I love about first class is if you go to an airport, and probably not right now, but pre-COVID, there was always like this like hustle and bustle, this competitive nature at the airport, right? People gather around, and they're waiting for their number or their aisle or their seating arrangement to be called. Why is that? Well, if you don't know why that happens, it's because people want to get their bags into the upper compartments. Because if you don't, as you know, if you don't get your bag in that upper compartment, you're going to have to check your bag. And there's a certain fear that comes with checking your bag. So in comes Chad Richards, first class. I just picture I'm going to go in. I'm going to tap people. Excuse me. Tap people on the shoulder. Excuse me. Are you first class? No. Okay, move, please. Move, peasants. I'm a person. The airline cares about me. All right? Step to the side, folks. And so I am going to use my first class badge and push everybody aside. And I am going to get on that plane before everybody else. There is a certain tension getting on a plane. People are frantic. No one wants to pay the fee. And that 
is how the pool of Bethesda is. You picture this pool, and, and you hear about this sheep gate, and it, it almost sounds like it's, it's cute, and it's intimate, and it's pretty and nice, and it is all in decent order. When in reality, no, that is not how it is. It is chaos, and people are not jostling to get toilet paper from a Costco or to get first class on an airplane, but they are jostling to get into a pool because if I am the one to get into that pool, if I beat everybody else, I can get healed, I can see, I can walk again. If I could be the first one, Can you imagine, put yourself, let's enter into the story right now, you guys. Can you imagine being that person? What kind of competitiveness would take over? Can you imagine how these people could feel during this moment? The scripture says this, whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease. Imagine the angst, the stress, the mistrust, that would happen, only one person would get healed. Who's it gonna be? One person will get to see again. Here's the thing about the sick people there. Everyone saw them, believed one thing about them, that they were there and they were crippled or sick because God was punishing them for their sin. That was common belief in those days, that you're here because God is punishing you. You sinned, so you are crippled. It's your fault. This pool, you guys, it's not known in the health community. People didn't go here. It was on the peripheral of Jerusalem. They were outcasts of society. And then our story, it zooms in on this man who has been there for 38 years, 38 years sitting by a pool trying to be the one to get in. And our story, the lens, it, it zooms in on this guy. And it, surely he has had a reputation. Obviously, people know who he is. He's been there for so long. And in our story, we find ourselves in a place where no one really knows, a place that no one really goes, no one cares about, where all of the sick are. But here's the thing, though. Jesus is recorded of saying, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You think Jesus cares about these people? I think he does. Jesus came for these people, and he goes up to this man, and he says, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Look what the man says. He doesn't say, yeah, of course, which is what I would say. I'd be like, yeah, obviously, Jesus. Look what the man says. He says, I have no one. I have nobody. I have no one to help me. It's almost like he's implicitly asking, Jesus, will you be the one to get me into the pool? I have no one that will care about me. Will you be the one? This man stands in his space of failure and he looks to the son of God and he asks him to take him to a pool for healing. Not knowing that the person transcended above the pool, the actual healer, the creator of heaven and earth is standing right in front of him. But he just wants to get in the pool. Not knowing who Jesus really is. He does not know that the man standing in front of him is transcendent beyond a pool. And how many times in my life, how many times in your life, if you're sitting here right now, have you looked to something else? Have you looked to a pool for healing when the healer is standing right in front of you? You look to your politics for healing. You look to the bottle for healing. You look to inappropriate relationships for healing. When the healer is standing right in front of you and just saying, if you would just come to me, if you would accept this invitation to intimacy, I will hold you, my daughter. I will comfort you, my son. But what we say is we say, I just want to be in the pool. I just want to self-medicate. And Jesus' Jesus's response is nothing short of hilarious. He says, take up your mat and walk. 
take up your mat and walk. You might not realize how funny this is, because what we do is, is we look at Jesus, and we know how the story is going to end up. So we say, oh, man, like how authoritative Jesus is. He's, he's got such, such compassion and such power. But if you don't know who Jesus is in this moment, this is like the most like inappropriate, kind of like uh, jaw-dropping thing to say to somebody. The modern-day equivalent would be if Jonathan, our worship leader, came up to me and said, hey, Chad, I can't play this Sunday. I have strep throat. And then I respond, why don't you just buckle up and have a beautiful voice like Taylor Swift, like suck it up, Jonathan. <laughs> that is like the modern-day equivalent. The man asked for help. And Jesus says, take up your mat and walk. Jesus looks at a man who has been there for almost 40 years and says, why, like, why don't you just get up? And it's like, excuse me, Captain Obvious? Trust me, Jesus. If I could, I would have by now. Why does Jesus do this? Why, why does he tell him just to get up and walk? Well, we got to go back to what we talked about earlier. What does everyone believe about this man? Well, they believe he's there, crippled, because God is punishing him because of his sin. So two things got to happen. Number one, for him to get healed, there's two options. Number one, he gets into the pool. The angel stirs it up. He's the first one to get into the pool. Or number two, if God is punishing him for his sin, then number two, the option to get healed would be for God to forgive him of his sin. So Jesus says, take up your mat and walk. Everyone that is watching this believes that this, if this man were to get up and walk without going into the pool, then clearly God has forgiven him of his sin. Everyone watching this back then does not know who this man is. And you got to imagine that if we're, if we're looking at this like from a film perspective, if you're watching this movie for the very first time and you don't know who Jesus is, but you know the context and, and the things that people are thinking, what they are believing, that surely this man is crippled because he has sinned. Picture this on a, on, a, on a screen at Regal Cinemas, and, and the story zooms on this man as he gets up and walks, and then the story zooms back to Jesus, and surely everybody, you could hear a pin drop, and it had to have gotten silent. Is God among us? This man is walking. This is impossible. Did God just forgive his sin in front of us? This is where if you have friends that say Jesus was just a good teacher, but he wasn't God, this is where that argument falls to the ground. And here's why. If Jesus is not God, he is a lunatic. I mean, imagine a guy that is not God just going around and forgiving sins, going up to you and saying, hey, I forgive you of your sin and follow me, kind of like an anti-stalker. But imagine him going up to you and saying, hey, I forgive you of your sin. And then you say, well, like, are you God? And he's like, nah, like, but it's cool, dude. Like, I got you. I forgive you. If he's not God, he is a lunatic. Only God can heal like this. Only God can forgive people of their sins. Jesus looks at this man, get up and walk. And I think you sitting here today, you've, you've experienced what Jesus does right here. Because even this is kind of odd of what, what Jesus does right here. This is like that friend that throws Christian cliches out at you. My last church we were serving at, I was there for two years, and we had a student take his own life. It, it wrecked the youth group. It rattled everybody. It, it brought our church to deep places theologically we have never explored before. It challenged me to really wrestle in my faith because people started throwing Christian cliches out. They started saying things like, well, heaven gained another angel. God has a bigger plan. My own personal favorite, just trust God. And in my head, I, I was wrestling with my faith. I went like, I, I can't just trust God. It's not that easy. And people kept saying, just trust God. I, I got to the place where I'm like, I'm going to trust God so much, I'm going to punch you in the face right now. I was so frustrated. And I started wrestling with my faith. It's not that easy to trust God sometimes. Jesus is that friend in this instance. And it's almost like he's from another world. Just do it. Just get up. 
You want to walk? Go for it. (laughs) It's not that easy, Jesus. You see, Jesus seems to think that he has the power in order to heal this man. And as the story goes on, we realize that he does. He thinks he can, and then he proves it when he does. This should not be possible if a man is paralyzed. This should not happen, and it leaves us going as God among us. And then a group of religious people find him, and they argue with him. You can't be healed on a holy day. This man was paralyzed, and now he walks, and they ask him, they ask him, who healed you? And the man doesn't know. The man doesn't care. He's like, I don't know. I couldn't walk, and now I can. Like, I I don't know who it was. I didn't get his name. What I love is that Jesus goes, and he finds this guy. He goes up to him and says this. It's on the screen for you. Do not sin anymore. See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. Sorry, throw that one back up, Miles. Thank you. See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. That's not a good bumper sticker on your car, okay? Don't, don't get that on your car. We misinterpret this as a church sometimes, and we often read it as, don't you go live your old life in sin, because if you do, like, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to get you. In reality, I don't think that's what's going on here. I think what Jesus is saying is you think being paralyzed By a pool for 38 years is bad. Try eternal separation from God. You could have your legs and walk straight into hell with them. I don't know if you've ever done that in your life, but I have been in that place in my life where I am living like hell. Yeah, I got my heaven card, but I'm living like hell right now. I'm looking to all of the the things as my pool for healing when the healer is standing right in front of me, and I'm saying, you know what? It's a lot more comfortable in there. I don't know if you guys have ever done that in your life, but my guess is you have, and we've looked to the pool for our healing, and you look at this guy, and the, the story, it's not about a man's spine and legs working. This is not just about a healing. It's about a healer. This man is not just healed physically, but he is healed spiritually as well. This story is not just about a man's spine and his legs, but it's about his soul being healed. It's about Jesus. He has to come back. He does not want this man to be confused. He wants him to know who it was that did the healing because it is about Jesus. Look what the man did next. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus that made him well. Jesus was compelled to introduce himself and make sure that this man knew that it was God that healed him that it was Jesus that healed him. The healing was just the opener to the story. This was just an opening to a man's whole new life. That fact right there tells you if you are watching and you do not know Jesus right now, if you're just checking this out because someone sent you a leak, this story right here tells you this. You could have that new opening in your life. If you have never made that commitment to Jesus, I encourage you to do that today to make that commitment, to cross the line from disbelief to belief, from atheist to faith, from agnostic to faith in Jesus, because this could be an opening to a whole new life for you. This is about the fact that Jesus is the one that can introduce any single person to a whole new world inside and out. If you're taking notes, write this down. This man was healed physically from Jesus' words, but he was redeemed inside by his presence. That's the invitation to intimacy for us today. Because this life that we're living right now, life is the pool. Life is getting into it. It's the hustle and bustle. I can do it. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get in the pool. I'm going to get my five minutes of fame. These people were so focused on the healing, not knowing that the healer was standing amongst them. How many times have we been so blinded by life thinking that other things are going to bring us healing when Jesus says, would you just accept my invitation to intimacy? Just start there. Look to me for the healing, not the pool.
as we start to end here, there's a couple different applications whether you're at home, whether you're here with us today, I think there's a couple different applications here for different people groups. There are people listening and watching right now, and you have been sold a lie, and you have been going to something else for healing and not the healer, and the healer is standing right in front of you. The invitation to intimacy for you is to go to Jesus for your healing and not the pool. If you look at the story and the way the man was healed, in this context, a lot came with that healing because a big part of it, this man was not accepted by society because of his crippled, because of him being crippled, because of him being an invalid. He was not accepted by his society. So this man was healed physically, emotionally, spiritually, and he was accepted. The second people group I want to speak to, there's some people watching right now, you just need to hear that, that you're accepted. (laughs) You're accepted by God. Your invitation to intimacy is just to live in that acceptance that God does love you. Regardless of what you've done, you're accepted. The last group I want to speak to is maybe God's been calling you to something and you've been looking to the, to the easy route instead. You know what? You see the pool, it's a quick fix. That's your easy route. Because what we do as Christians when we're trying to, to discern God's will is we always pray for it to be easy. I remember when I, when, I, when I pray for things, sometimes I go, God, would you just open the door, God? Would you just make it obvious? You know, sometimes God's will isn't the easiest thing. Sometimes that door is locked because God wants you to kick it down to demonstrate faith. Some of you are watching right now and God's been calling you to something and you feel like the door is locked on it. God wants you to kick that door down to demonstrate faith. Others, that door, sh- that door is open and you need to not walk through it because it ain't God. That's where spiritual formation comes in. That's where intimacy with Jesus comes in. To learn to discern his heart to learn to listen to his voice. Our faith can't just be something we do on a Sunday. Our faith must be something we are taking with us and letting it shape our daily life, whether it's prayer, getting into the word. Sometimes it's just connecting the dots in your world and learning to see the ordinary things as spiritual things. When you're with your kids, when you're playing a game with them, when you're at your job, learning to see that all things in life have spiritual implications to them. This week, some of us need intimacy with Jesus. Some of us need to give something up that has become our pool. Some of us just need that reminder that we're accepted. Let me pray for these different people groups. Would you close your eyes with me? God, I pray for the first group, Lord. I pray for the people that have been sold a lie. You're, you're listening and you're hearing my voice right now. And if you're at home right now and your heart is starting to race, that probably is speaking to you. That is God speaking to you. He wants you to listen. And I want to tell you on behalf of him, you have been looking to something else for healing. You've been looking to a pool for healing and you got to give it up. It's time to turn to Jesus for your healing. And the beautiful part in this is it's, it's, not, it's not too late. <laughs> God still loves you. God still accepts you. I want to pray right now for that group. If that is you as you're watching and listening, I pray for strength. I pray for courage. I pray against the enemy that has been telling you lies. And I pray that you would make that step away from the pool towards Jesus. Number two, I want to pray for people that just need to hear the simple words that they're accepted. When I first heard that, that I was accepted, it was in a prison cell. Changed everything for my life. If you're watching right now and you just need to hear that, on behalf of your loving Father, on behalf of His Spirit, look at me right now. You are accepted by God. I pray that these people would know that they are accepted, Lord. And then the third group, you're trying to discern God's will, whether it's a door you got to kick down or a door you got you got to really avoid. God, I pray for this group, that they would have the Holy Spirit 
guiding their every thought, guiding their every move, guiding their every decision, and that they would hear from you. And God, if they're not hearing from you and they're having trouble discerning, I pray, God, we're not meant to do this alone. We're better together. I pray they would get a pastor, get someone in their faith community that could come alongside them to help them discern what God's will is for their next move. I pray that these people would be bold, Lord, in their faith. And so God, right now, I pray that we would be deeply encouraged by this invitation to intimacy with you. That if there is any feeling of I'm not good enough or, or any, any shame, that that shame would go away, but it would lead to a healthy conviction that moves us forward because that is what you call you, us to. That is what you call your people to. And if you believe it, all God's people say, amen. <laughs>